Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to our Friday morning Arizona Bioscience Week event, Voice of the Patient. So for the last five days, we have been having the scientists and the doctors and the researchers and the innovators telling us what they do for patients. Today is extremely important because now the patients are going to talk to us about their experience and what they need. So I, first of all, want to thank all of our patient speakers who are with us today. It's really important, and we are so grateful for everything that you do. And for the members of the audience, the people that will be watching this online, um, thank you for listening to the patient's voices. So with that, um, our sponsor today is Dignity Health, and um, we have a little video for you. When an encounter is personal, when fear is soothed by presence, when kindness resounds in every interaction, when empathy is embedded in every question, when tenderness defines every touch, when the unknown is enveloped with faith, when that which is beyond us comforts us. Magical moments of human kindness are created. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, we're going to try one more time. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, now I feel the energy. Good morning. My name is Gabrielle Finley Hazel, and I have the privilege of being the president and CEO for Dignity Health Central and West Valley. I'm based right here uh, adjacent to this campus at St. Joseph's. And I wanted to just let you know one of the reasons why we really were excited about sponsoring this particular segment is because of the hard work that our teams do to really impact the patient's experience. And we thought it was so important for us to be able to hear directly from patients and really hear the voice of the patient. Um, just to give you a sense, I think many of you know that we have Bayer Neurological Institute that sits on our campus, Norinthoracic Institute, as well as many other service lines where we're touching hundreds and thousands of patients every day. And most recently, we were just uh, recognized as being one of the top 10% in the country for patient experience. Our director of patient experience, Brian, is in the audience. Maybe you can just wave for a moment. Um, he's brought some amazing uh, best practices for us. And so we want to just continue that conversation of hearing directly from patients, particularly when it comes to some of the innovations that are happening that we think are great, and sometimes they're not so great uh, based on what we hear. So those are um, really important data points for us. Um, so I just wanted to first welcome everyone. Thank you for spending time. For those of you that are going to share your stories, thank you. Um, because for us as hospital team members, it's so important for us to understand the perspective of the patient. So once again, welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for the privilege of uh, being able to host and sponsor this part of the event this week. Have a great morning. Please welcome to the stage, Rob Cervik. Good morning, everybody. I mean, I'm incredibly nervous. Uh, my voice is a little shaky. It's not ALS. It's uh, speaking to you guys. So <laughs> anyways, this picture is a great picture. This is... Uh, right when I had my first symptoms of ALS. This is October of 2018. This was at the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, <clears throat> that athlete there, lifting him up to the equipment, representing Team USA, that was the first time I experienced like struggles trying to be strong with my left arm. 
right after that competition, I went and checked out the doctors. I got diagnosed with uh, cervical herni disc herniation. So I got a cervical fusion. Um, gave about a year for that to heal, to realize that I was still getting weaker, and uh, kept pursuing my diagnosis. And <clears throat> then COVID hit. So um, October 2018 was my first symptom. My ALS di diagnosis was at August of 2020. So it was a pretty big journey to get there and get diagnosed. Um, but in that time, you find you need a lot of things in ALS. I've had about six different doctors already, um, some better than others. Um, and each one I learned something from. And what I think we need is we need four things in ALS and other rare diseases, I'm, I'm assuming. We need uh, information, we need clinical trial data, we need advocacy, and we need urgency. <clears throat> with information, people with ALS are getting a lot of their information online from other patients instead of from their doctors. At clinic, we need to know. We need to know that some people, when you get diagnosed, you need to you need to know that some people live beyond two to five years. I am four years into my ALS journey. I'm not dying this year. <clears throat> clinical trials, you only qualify for clinical trials if you're two to three years from sy symptom onset, typically. It has to be before that. Once you go over three years, you no longer qualify for trial. Currently, I'm pretty much done with any option for clinical trials. Even though if you look at me, I'm still savable. Um, but we need info about clinical trials and which ones neurologists recommend. We need automatic genetic testing. Right now, um, we're discovering so much with ALS um, and the genetic mutations that are involved with ALS. And most of the places around the country when you get diagnosed with ALS, they're not going to talk about genetic testing much at all, or they're going to do a simplified panel. We know now that you need a complete genome testing for ALS. That should be automatic on your first day of diagnosis. We need a one-page summary of DME and other things we may, need, we may need to consider in the future. We need a one-page summary of contacts of organizations that can help with various things. Team Gleason with power wheelchairs um, and voice, voice to speech um, saving, banking your voice. We need to know those things. I had to figure those out on my own. No doctor told me to go to Team Gleason to record my voice. We need a one page, um, we, need, we need to know the warning signs and things that we need to know when we go to a hospital. So I recently had a friend that passed away from, they say, from ALS. But he went to the hospital, and they gave him oxygen. He wasn't able to off-gas the CO2, so it became toxic in his system. Not every emergency room knows that. We need to make sure that everyone does. We need information about off-label therapies and the willingness to prescribe them. We, m we know they may not work, but if you don't give people something, they are going to find things on the black market like the Dallas Buyers Club in the HIV community. In clinical trials, we need to follow the Morris ALS principles, which set standards for drug sponsors, researchers, organizations, and patients to ensure ALS is equitable. We need to include patients at our scientific conferences. We always have patients on your advisory boards. You should always have a patient on your advisory board. It's not about you without you. It's not about me without me. Make clinical trial patient-centric with open labels, EAPs, and low placebo ratios. We need to use telehealth for some clinical trial visits and add more locations to make trial access easier. We need to commit to give patients something back from trials, like full genome sequencing. In turn, we will help boost enrollment in clinical trials so that you can get top-line data out more quickly. In advocacy, I've done a lot of advocacy since I've been diagnosed. 
We want research to help patients of tomorrow, but we also want drug access for the patients of today. First patient our first patient advocacy got ALS research funding increased from $10 million a year to $40 million a year. Second, they got Congress to waive the five-month waiting period to qualify for Medicare disability. Although I'll tell you, it still takes about six months to argue with Medicare whether or not you have ALS when you're going through the process, but that's a different story. Third, patients fought to pass a $500 million bill called the Act for ALS to put drugs in bodies and collect data to advance the science of ALS. That was pretty much a complete grassroots advocacy. And we had three members of Congress not vote yes for it, and 100% of the Senate voted yes for it. Um, and today, this morning, um, Trejalos just got funding through this. So there will be a group of people that get expanded access thanks to this grassroots advocacy group pushing through the Act for ALS. Most neurologists didn't agree with it at first. They only focused on research. But it was one of the top 100 most co-sponsored bills in the last half century. Yesterday, the FDA approved a drug called Amelix AMX0035, now called it was just named yesterday, so I may be wrong, but it's Relivrio, Relivrio. So however you want to pronounce it, um, they just named it something crazy yesterday. I wish they gave drugs more normal names. It took six years, but patients got the FDA to adopt a guidance document where they agreed to exercise regulatory flexibility for ALS therapies, given the critical and met need. This document was the basis of yesterday's decision to approve Amelex's drug. Several neurologists met with Congress and testified at congressional hearings to ask FDA to exercise regulatory flexibility so it doesn't treat ALS drugs like acne drugs. The approval happened because the drug sponsor, patients, and neurologists all worked together. There are some amazing neurologists out there that are doing so much to help fight in our advocacy world. But we need all of our neurologists to be that way. As a neurologist, you should be on top of that. There's just no other way. You have to fight for your patients. Finally, urgency. In the ALS community, we call it the ALS clock. We need everyone involved to move with the same urgency as, for, as ALS acts on the body. Triage ALS like we showed up as a level one trauma patient in need of surgery. Drug sponsors and IRBs at institutions that run clinical trials need to get IRBs triaged for diseases that are imminently life-threatening. The FDA must approve drugs with urgency. The average right now is 15 to 19 years for a development of a neurological drug. Keep blocks of appointments open. This is really, really important, guys. It took me six months to get in to see a doctor. Keep blocks of appointments open for new patients so people don't need to wait that long for a diagnosis or a referral. You guys should always have a spot open for a new patient. So that's my, that's my, that's my speech. We need urgency advocacy, information, and clinical trial knowledge. If we get these things, I think we can make ALS a lot more pleasant for us that are living with it. And by the way, I'm, like I said, I'm not dying from ALS. I'm certainly thriving and living for ALS. Thank you, guys. Welcome, Annie Foster. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for allowing me to be here and just share a little bit about my experience. So um, I think my bio in the materials explains that I am the general counsel to Governor Ducey. I want to make clear I'm not here on his behalf today. I'm here on my own and my family. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my story. 
I went to the governor's office um, in 2018. I've been with his administration since um, 2015. During that time, um, he and our administration have worked on a number of innovations, including building this campus, opening the Dignity Cancer Center campus downtown, um, advocating and um, implementing telehealth here in Arizona, um, the right to try, and a number of other innovations, most recently um, genomic testing. I never realized that any of those things back when any of them were going on would actually impact my life. So back in 2020, we all remember 2020 and COVID. Um, as the general counsel, my job was to assist the governor in all the legalities that were required. It was a 24-7 job. It's always a 24-7 job. I would say it was a 48-7 job um, in that time. Um, you never realize how many hours are in the day until you actually need every single one of them. Um, we had a spike in the middle of 2020 here in Arizona that everybody's probably well aware of. And as that spike decreased towards the fall, we were in the middle of lots of litigation. And it was about two years ago um, last week that I happened to find a lump in my breast. Um, so in the middle of all of this that was going on, I now also needed to deal with a very personal issue. Um, I was very blessed in dealing with that issue. Um, I, my doctors got me in uh, for a mammogram, and as I was doing the mammogram and the ultrasound, um, the um, tech was very helpful, and she actually fit me in for a biopsy that afternoon. Let me tell you, that, that urgency, um, as was mentioned, was amazing. I didn't have to wait because I've had several friends since contact me and they have had to wait for three weeks in between those um, things. I was able to get in that afternoon. There are small blessings in COVID. People weren't coming in for testing and so there was space. Um, I got in that afternoon and they did my biopsy. And so within three days, I knew that I had invasive ductal carcinoma. Um, they told me luckily it was early. It was a small stage 2A. It's, um, you know, 21 days of radiation and I would be done, um, probably no issue. Um, but as life would have it, it's not always that simple for the patients that are in this room. You always realize that what you get told initially um, is not always how it ends up. So I meet with an amazing oncologist um, at Dignity Health, and that experience, again, I was so blessed with. I had a friend who had previously had breast cancer and she made a recommendation for a doctor. And I went to see Dr. Went um, down at Dignity Cancer Center. But when I called Dignity Cancer Center um, and told them what was going on, because when I had the biopsy, they said, you're gonna wanna have this removed. Again, that was essential. I wasted no time. They gave me a list of doctors to call and I was able to get into, within three weeks, see my doctors. But it didn't just stop there. Dignity set it up so that when I went in for my very first appointment, I saw the surgeon, I saw the oncologist, I saw a social worker. And that day, which again was hard, because we were all wearing masks. Um, you couldn't, I couldn't have family with me that day because they live in other areas of the country. But they left me in one room and they all came to me. And I can't tell you how important that was. I didn't have to try to find a room as I was so emotional. So I met with them and got all kinds of information but the most essential that day was the, genetic, the geneticist who came and spoke with me and said, you know, 
we don't know, you know, do you want genetic testing? That was my only complaint that day is that it should have been absolutely mandatory that I had genetic testing. But I knew enough that I should have gotten it and I said yes. You see, when I was growing up, I had a grandmother who died of breast cancer. She was 48, but I didn't know that until I started going through my process because she died in 1968. No one in the family knew because it was mostly men in my family. So there wasn't this line of breast cancer um, deaths or survivors in my family to point to an issue that we should be looking at. But also what I didn't know is that the gene that, in, that makes you susceptible to breast cancer, BRCA, also makes you susceptible to a number of other cancers. And as I sat, sat there with my genetic counselor and we laid out my family tree, it became, it became very obvious that there was a very real likelihood that there was a genetic issue in our family. Fast forward, I had surgery and then um, Dr. Went recommended, um, you know, did some testing on the tumor and, um, you know, you get that oncotype diox spit out where, you know, it gives you this number and tells you whether, you know, chemotherapy is going to be helpful or not. And I got the answer I didn't want to hear, which was chemotherapy is the recommendation. And I actually argued, I'm an attorney, I argued with Dr. Wendt. And I said, well, is this really necessary? You didn't find it in my lymph nodes. It, it, you know, you got the tumor. It's not in the, in the margin. So, you know, do I really, really need to go through chemotherapy? Because I didn't want to lose my hair. I was in the middle of an amazing um, job and some major projects that I couldn't step away from. And so he said, well, it's your decision. Another really important piece. Don't assume that um, patients are just going to take your advice because they need to weigh it in terms of what's going on in their lives and what's important. Likewise, I did not opt for a double mastectomy, which is what my surgeon wanted me to do because I was going to have to make that decision in such a short amount of time and it wasn't a necessary decision at that time. So after arguing with Dr. Went a little bit, him talking to me about the likelihood of recurrence, I said, okay, we got to do this. And so we moved forward. But I share all of this because it's all been such a blessing. So let's go back to that genetic testing. After I got the genetic testing and found out that I was BRCA positive, they ask you, as many people in this room know, to share that information with your family. And I did. I shared it with my family and I felt guilty. And make sure that you're aware that your patients will feel guilty for sharing that information with their family. So that led to my family doing genetic testing. My sister is BRCA positive, and she has since had a double mastectomy. But most importantly, my first cousin had testing, and she was BRCA positive. So there's a number of preventative surgeries that you can do. And my first cousin went through them as well. And in the middle of a hysterectomy, her surgeon found cancer that she had no symptoms for. And although they thought it was ovarian and they thought they had caught it early, it turned out that it was pancreatic cancer. And Three weeks after her surgery, when she found out it was a diagnosis none of us could
could have imagined. She and her hus husband both called me. And they said, Annie, you saved her life because we caught it early enough that she is able to have quality of life and go through treatment and will be able to spend more time with their children who are still young. She is currently going through um, treatment. She's gone through her first round of chemo and she is coming up on a year of survival of pancreatic cancer. So I have been blessed with an amazing patient experience and I hope you can take some of those things to share uh, with people you work with. But above and beyond that, the one thing that we need to absolutely make sure is that patients are being told to share their experiences with their families and also understand what their family history is. And with that, I thank you. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Andrea Tyler Evans. Thank you, Joan. I'm honored uh, to be here today. I'm the owner and publisher of Front Doors Media and the Red Book a company that tells incredible stories about our community. Thank you for having me here today to tell a little of mine. 10 years ago, after having a baby and having what I thought was uh, my first series of sinus infections, I had a routine outpatient uh, procedure at St. Joe's for nasal polyps. Following that surgery, I was told that there was a growth behind the polyps about the size of a golf ball. But not to worry, go home, rest, and we'll see you on Monday to um, take care of all the, the post-op work. That next visit started with the doctor flipping his little doctor flip phone, and I heard the word neuroblastoma as he was hanging up the, the, the phone. And he told my husband and I that he had just hung up with Dr. Robert Spetzler of Barrow Neurological Institute. And I had a very, very rare form of cancer called esthesio neuroblastoma, cancer of your olfactory gland. Do you know how small your olfactory gland is? About the size of your pinky fingernail. This is a very rare form of cancer, about one in 2.1 million. I'd rather have my odds be the uh, odds of hitting a hole in one with that golf ball, but this was a different situation for sure. This was 10 years ago. I received excellent care from the team at Barrow and after healing from my first uh, bout with, with uh, cancer, I asked Dr. Spetzler, so how many of me have you seen in your career as he was getting ready to uh, retire? And he sat back, it was this Dr. Spetzler, right? And he said, maybe you're number 20. There are only eight places in the country where you would go and get treated uh, for this type of cancer. They were shocked that I lived up the street. The cancer has returned twice, most recently in early 2020, just as COVID was hitting, and it returned in my lymph nodes and my neck. This was always an area that they told me to watch out for, so I wasn't surprised when this happened. Um, it actually made me more determined than ever to 
uh, be treated and be treated as thoroughly as possible. For patients like me with extremely rare cancers, you're always in this state of, um, we don't know. And that's really hard to hear as a patient, especially when you also hear you're so young. You have, you know, these children to take care of and, you know, we see you own, own your own business. So you're in this very odd place whenever you're, you know, with your team of physicians and, and all of the support staff. And there's no research when you're a one in 2.1 million type of person. Um, but there is a network of the doctors that care for patients like me. And so you do hear little um, pieces of that as you come back, um, in my case, three times for treatment. So just some thoughts on that and that kind of instance um, for those of you um, that work with teams that see patients that in conditions that are considered truly rare. Cancer is not rare anymore. I don't care how old you are. Um, I don't like being told that anymore. Cancer is abundant across all ages, all people, and it is, you know, becoming systematic as a, as a diagnosis. I fear that um, cancer will surpass heart disease as the number one killer in this country. It's a very real issue. So being told that you're rare, I, I wish that language would really go away. Communication. <laughs> I'm a communicator, and that is my uh, biggest thing and, and what I try to do to advocate for myself, um, especially when you go, you know, from place to place. Um, in my case, I have an ENT, I have an oncologist, I have a surgeon. Um, I've had a few side issues from this, so some other specialist appointments. And it's hard, and I can't imagine if um, other people who are, who are, this is not their profession, to kind of piece together all those appointments. And whether you're a good note taker or not, I am not. Um, there needs, I think, in today's world of technology, a better way to collect all of that info. And again, dumbed down for you know the husbands and the mothers and the other people that care for us that could be shared of what is the long-term plan? What are we looking at? So you're in the appointment and you're hearing all these things, but you go back to regurgitate it and it, and it doesn't go well. Um, so I'm here to advocate today for um, something that could be done about that so that all the little things that are being thrown your way, which sometimes not great news, uh, which throws you into another state, uh, could be done to simplify um, the patient's need and a little bit more of a roadmap, especially in your most complicated uh, cases. But I love being a barrel patient. I'm so fortunate and blessed to live in this community, and I really appreciate you all being here today. Thank you. Please welcome Lena Spottleson. On July 26, 2006, my life changed. A month after being married, I felt a dull stomach pain. I went to the doctor who ordered several tests, only to become up empty-handed in all of them. That doctor sent me to another doctor, who also performed a bunch of tests. Again, no luck. I went to doctor after doctor in search of what could possibly be the answer to my stomach pain. That day, July 26th, I walked into the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona, expecting the same. After several minutes of waiting in the office, a slender man walked into the room, and I remember thinking how well-dressed and put together he was. I sat on the doctor's table, my husband on the bench next to me. 
The gentleman walked in, shook her hand, took a deep breath, and sat down in the chair in front of us. He had kind eyes, and I remember how sad they looked when he made eye contact with me. He said, Lena, you have cancer, and I'm going to show you why. He pulled up the images on the screen and began to mumble off a bunch of medical terms, talking about dark masses, but everything was so unclear after that. I don't remember what he said or how long he talked. I looked at my husband, who had tears coming down his cheeks, and me doing everything I could to hold it together, only to be dealt one more awful blow. Now, Lena, he said, as gently as he possibly could, you won't be able to have children after this. And we need to get you into surgery right away. I couldn't hold it in any longer. I took a deep breath as tears began to trickle down my face as I scheduled my surgery. After nine months of no answers, I finally had one, cancer. A week later, I was in surgery. A surgery that was supposed to take only three hours went on and on as they te tested each part of my body. Once they found the cancer, they cut it up, took it out, one organ after another. First my uterus, top of my cervix, followed by my ovary, my gallbladder, my appendix, and lastly, a handful of lymph nodes down my left sides. Piece by piece, they took my insides. The next day, I remember being able to read my family's faces and knew they weren't telling me everything. The doctors came in to see me pretty early that day to discuss how surgery went and my, what my next steps were. They diagnosed me with stage four cancer and gave me a 25% chance of survival. I needed the most aggressive form of treatment if I had any shot at beating this. I started chemotherapy almost immediately as I recovered from my surgery. My hair didn't start falling out until about three weeks later. My husband and I wanted to go to Disneyland to celebrate our one-year anniversary. The doctors didn't want to let me go, and everyone told me it was a bad idea. But I was stubborn about going. I had received enough bad news, and I needed to make myself happy, and who isn't happy in Disneyland? I was sick, still nauseous, and weak as the chemo was working through my body. My husband and I drove out to Disneyland, only making a couple of stops to try to get me to the hotel to lie down as soon as possible. That night, my hair got worse. It was coming out more in handfuls at this point. I sent my husband the next morning to Target across the street from the hotel to buy some clippers to shave my head. And when he came back, we laid down newspaper on the hotel floor, and my husband, on our one-year anniversary, shaved my head. That last day of November, I became the sickest. I remember vomiting and not being able to control it. When I made it to the hospital, I walked up to the room that they had reserved for me and immediately began to have chest pain. The nurse laid me down on the bed, put a blood pressure cuff on, cuff on me. I glanced at the blood pressure monitor to see that my blood pressure was 40 over 20 before I blacked out. I had gone into septic shock. They put me on a ventilator and in a drug-induced coma for four days. That night, they told my family that I wouldn't make it through the night. Everyone came down to see me. The ICU waiting room was filled with my family and friends, not knowing if I would make it out of there alive. Despite every blow that I had taken on this journey, every time cancer tried to knock me down, I was ready to take on even this. I walked out of the hospital on December 10, 2006. In January of 2007, I received my first clear scan. Treatment was finally over. I grew up wanting to be a teacher. I spent 11 years in the classroom before I made the very difficult decision to leave that profession that I love to help fight cancer for others. I work for the American Cancer Society, the number one funder of cancer research, only second to the federal government. And that's why I chose that. The things I want to talk to you about today is that as a 26-year-old newly married teacher, not knowing what was happening with my body, I kept going to doctors for answers. And they were sending me to other doctors and even one doctor told me it was in my head and they tried to prescribe me antidepressants. So what I want to encourage today is to get screened, to talk about fertility with your patients, because that was very important to me, and to listen to that 26-year-old patient that walks into your room. Thank you. Please welcome to the, to the stage David Larwood, Matthew Nelson, and Dylan P.A. Well, 
Oh, you're gonna make me do it that way. So why don't you take that one? Thanks. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you guys. We haven't met Dylan. Matt, nice to meet you. So healthcare is such an important thing. I'm very touched by the stories that we've heard from these people. Uh, my personal story is I had polio as a child. My father had polio at the same time. Uh, polio was acute. It lasts about 10 days. It's like influenza. Then it's done. And you're left with what's left. It causes, it causes nerve damage. It eats up your nerves. So I have a um, very weak single leg. My father, uh, we were in in Korea as medical missionaries and there was no vaccine available for us. Actually, the vaccine didn't exist anywhere at the time. It was just coming into availability. And um, uh, my father, taking care of his family, stepped in and took care of me. And I, I said to him later, you got polio because you were protecting mother. He denied it. He said we were probably exposed at the same time. But uh, polio, is, as I said, is, is, is brief, um, but then you're basically, okay, you're, you, you have what you're left with. There in the old days, there were iron lungs. Now they put you on a ventilator. Less than 1% of people have residual effects like mine. Polio has something that comes in late. Um, I, uh, I have post-polio, so in my late 40s, I started getting weaker and weaker, and I'll have progression until I die. My father, in his last days, was in a wheelchair and, and uh, didn't move very well. I'm very touched by the stories that we heard. My mother died of brain cancer. My wife had breast cancer in that moment when you say, what? and you just kind of go blank. I've experienced that, and it's, it's difficult for the individual, but caregivers are very important. I'll tell you one more small thing. I was chatting with Joan. I've, I've been in touch with Joan for a long time in uh, August, and we're talking about COVID. And so I had COVID in July, as did my wife. Uh, mine was fairly brief. It was like a cold. I was you know, sick for three days and got better with some residual. My wife's was tougher. Um, you know, Six weeks later, she was still weak. She's it's now three months, and she's still re residually weak. Um, I mentioned my father in healthcare. I, I'm, a, I'm a drug scientist. Uh, I'm pursuing a PhD at UC San Francisco. In my first round, I invented a component of the vaccine. Um, and I uh, studied you know, the, how, how you do these advances and find these diseases. Um, and a final, so I've been pursuing a valley fever for a long time. So I work very closely with the valley fever community. Uh, there's a COXI study group. Somebody mentioned uh, you know, meetings, you know, patient advocacy. The COXI study group has met annually since the middle 50s. My father joined in 1958, uh, and patients come to these meetings, and it's really wonderful to share experiences with others. But enough about me. Dylan, tell, me your, uh, tell us your, 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 your disease story. Uh, sure. So my name is Dylan P.A. I am 29 years old. Uh, I'm originally from Philadelphia. I moved to the Phoenix area to pursue my Ph.D. at ASU. Uh, March of 2021, I... Awoke one morning, surrounded by paramedics, and they told me I had a seizure. Prior to that, I never had any sort of health scare at all. I never even really had to visit the doctor more than the once a year general checkup. And so following that, I was brought to a hospital. They told me it may just be a one-off seizure, quickly released me, and then I was brought back home. And then I actually had another seizure that day. And then they brought me back to the hospital, Luckily, I have mentors that are very, very experienced. My girlfriend contacted some of my mentors, and then they recommended that I be brought to uh, Banner. So I was brought to Banner, and then after some MRIs, uh, EEGs, they told me MRIs seemed fairly clear. They saw some white matter lesions. And as a neuroscientist, it popped in my head, oh, that could be possibly MS, and I asked the doctor, oh, could it be MS? They confirmed they were very, trying to be comforted, comfort me and say, oh no, it's not, chances are it's not MS, don't worry, you don't have any symptoms, See, a seizure could be a rare symptom, but it's likely not. And they also, uh, one of my neurologists was like, but just in case we're gonna give you a spinal tap, check your CSF. And about a week later, received some news with my, in my they found some oligoclonal banding in my CSF and then spoke with another neurologist and they said, yeah, you have MS, don't worry, no symptoms right now. A seizure is a very rare symptom. It could be, that could be your only seizure that one day that you had seizures. Put me on uh, infusion treatments and kind of sent me on my way. And then in the weeks later, I had multiple seizures 
kind of brought back to a hospital and then diagnosed with epilepsy as well. So now I'm kind of facing that kind of battle, finding the right treatment, right medication mixture to, so I can be seizure free. And yeah, that's kind of my overall story. So we'll dig into these stories a little bit, these details a little bit more. Matt, tell us your story, please. Um, so mine started off pretty uneventful. Uh, I came home on a Friday night and mentioned to my wife that my, the left side of my face felt numb. And her first thought was, you're having a stroke. And I said, well, I took my, my learning modules at Dignity Health uh, on stroke, recognizing what a stroke is. I said, it's not a stroke. Don't worry about it. it. I'll be fine. I was, you know, not to overgeneralize. I was a typical male. Everything's OK. I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm not going to worry about it. I said, I did acquiesce and say, if it's not any better by tomorrow morning, I'll go to urgent care. I got up in the morning. The numbness was still there. Tried to check in online. They said, we won't. It, essentially, I got a message that said, you can't check in online. Get here right away. Mm -hmm. Showed up at the urgent care. They rushed me in the back, worked me up for a stroke. They said, well, we don't think you're having a stroke, but we're going to send you to Chandler Regional just to be sure. But we're, And we're going to call you a, an ambulance. And I said, I drove myself here. I think I can take myself to Chandler Regional. I don't have to worry about the ambulance ride. So I drove to Chandler Regional. I showed up, and they're calling me over the intercom trying to find me. Once I walked in, I said that I'm here. And they rushed me back, worked me up for the stroke diagnosis. They couldn't find anything either. Um, they said, we don't know what's going on, but we're going to uh, refer you to a neurologist. Um, that was on Saturday. I happened to work at Barrow and, and Dignity Health, so I, in, in my role there in, in research, uh, I reached out to uh, one of the physicians that I knew, and I said, I've got this weird diagnosis. Can you get me in? Um, and it was just an email, so I didn't hear back. On Sunday, the, this is kind of a, an odd aspect, but um, I was at a hotel with my kids and my family, and we were jumping from the hot tub to the pool, and it was cold. And every time I got into the hot tub, um, I felt really sick, and I felt really fatigued. And then I'd get in the, in the pool, and it would go away. And then I would jump back in, and after three or four times, I was like, I, I got to go lay down. And I led with that story um, on Monday when I got in to see a neurologist at, uh, at, at Barrow. And they said, you know, that's, that's an interesting aspect. We're, we're, we're not really sure what's going on. And I said to the doctor, I said, my wife's not going to let me back in the house unless I get an MRI order. So they got me in to, for an MRI the next day. Um, and that was Tuesday. And, um, on Wednesday, I, I met with the physician again, and culminating the MRI results and the experience I had in the hot tub, they said, you have MS. Um, I had a number of lesions on my brain. Um, it was kind of shocking at the moment because I had gone through my whole life being pretty free of any sickness, or I hardly ever got sick, no colds, no flus, no nothing. Um, but it's, since then, it's been uh, a, a journey in, in that regards. Uh, went through a, a week of, um, uh, sorry, I get brain locked every once in a while, of uh, steroid infusions to bring the inflammation down. Um, I've been on a, a preventative uh, therapy for the last seven years. Everything seems to be OK, um, although I did have a new lesion develop. Uh, during a bout of COVID uh, back in June. Not really sure if it's because of the COVID or because of the MS, but I still have some follow-up to do on that. So uh, I'm going to share one more story because when Joan and I were talking, we were looking for a valley fever person. So since I see a lot of valley fever cases, I'll just touch on that because it fits this profile. Um, as you probably know, valley fever is a spore. We could be in here. We're, we're at risk right here. I mean, simply living in Phoenix, being in Phoenix for moments, you're at risk. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Uh, but if you're unlucky, you get the disease. It gets worse. For most people, they get better. For But a few people progress. And I have a friend in Bakersfield who has it in his brain. He suffered it for a long time, and it's really terrible. He has a, he has a, he, his therapy is a, an infusion thing that he gets refilled uh, once a week or 
or so that drips drug into his brain. So these are different forms of therapy. One of the things Joan wanted to talk I wanted to talk about was how your how your experiences influenced your perspective of the healthcare system. Oh uh, yeah, certainly. So I I'm finally starting to realize how much how important it is for patients to kind of be their own advocate. I think originally kind of early on my diagnosis with epilepsy, I kind of just accepted the treatments that they gave me. My seizures weren't, the frequency wasn't really changing with my early treatments. And luckily, again, mentors that had that experience really informed me that I have to be my, I have to really fight my own fight. So it's really important that, like originally I, was, I had no rescue med that they gave me, so it was just kind of, kind of up to me. But after learning that, okay, patients do have to be their own advocate is really one of the most crucial aspects, I think. And, and to add to that, if, if you can't be your own advocate, you need to have an advocate with you. Um, Dylan and I have a six degrees of Kevin Bacon in a sense. So one of his advocates is my wife, who was a big <laughs> advocate for me during this whole process. Um, and it's, it's there is a, a degree of getting the information from the physician and there's a degree of getting the information yourself online and then being able to process that. Uh, one thing that I would, I thought of as I was listening to the stories was that with the initial diagnosis, there was a state of shock and I wasn't really in a state of mind where I felt like I could make good decisions and having somebody there with you to help you process that information, I think is really important. So it's interesting that we have this, all three of us have this deep connection to the, to the healthcare system. You're connected with the hospital. I'm, I'm not sure if you're a science medical person, it's not important. Um, but, well, I'll, I'll ask you whether being around the healthcare system made it a little easier to process when you were going through this? Oh, it's absolutely easier. Um, the Barrow Neurology Clinic is right across the street, so I can go over there for neuro PT. I can go down eight flights of stairs to get my MRI, and then I can go back to work afterwards. So it's, it makes it really easy. To that, I would say that uh, having access to the healthcare um, makes it a big difference. You know, you don't want to be driving a couple hours away to get your, your treatment. You want to, if it's possible, to live in the community where you can get that treatment or at least have that resource available to you. Telehealth makes a big difference as well. So I spent a lot of time speaking at conferences about clinical trials because I'm advancing a drug and have to go through clinical trials and learn a lot about uh, telehealth and things like that. And you know, if you were in um, some remote section of the of the state, uh, you know that you know living in town or eight flights away from from where your treatment is or or a couple block you know very close by uh, makes a huge difference. Um, but same with your experience. You're a neuroscientist. Are you still studying this? Yes, I'm uh, completing my PhD right now, yeah. So I, I recall hearing uh, somebody spoke yesterday at White Hat or perhaps the day before about, uh, yeah, it was White, White, White Hat. When somebody in your family has a, a, a particularly a rare and devastating disease uh, and you have an opportunity to do research and help with that, where has that led you? Uh, so, yeah, certainly. My research that I conduct right now, it's very, it's preclinical. I focus on how chronic stress impacts the brain, but it definitely has, like my diagnosis has kind of made me really want to head more towards the translational route and really be able to really make that impact on people. I feel like what I'm doing right now, it, although it someday it will impact people, I really want to have that impact now. And Matt, your wife was uh, the, the caregiver thing. I mentioned that earlier. You know, if it's happening to you, that's tough. But if it's happening to a loved one, it's almost harder because you see you have a different perspective on it. How did your wife come to be? You know, the, how did she get informed? Did she, you know, there, there are people that did just so intensely into this. And I think of the Kavanaugh's as, as a perfect example. Like, we have a problem in our family. We're just going to study the heck out of this thing. How did, how did that evolve in your system? That would describe my wife to a T. She's, she knows where to get the information, um, it, both good and bad. We, we all have a tendency to doom scroll, which you have to be careful of. But she can, she can find the information. She can, uh, she's ingrained in the neuroscience community here as well. So uh, between the two of us, we were able to find the right, the right combination of things to do. So we only have a couple minutes left. Do um, you have some closing thoughts on what we could do better? Why don't we start with Matt this time? Um, the, the health community and then the system generally. Sure. 
you know, one thing that we're starting to do in the research environment at Barrow is uh, we have a new MS researcher that came in, in in August, and one of the things that she's bringing to the table and that I see a lot of value is, is to set up a biobank of samples from patients. And she's going to focus on MS, and it's not only just in coordination with clinical trials because you want to bank those samples as well but it's also from the research perspective and the federal funding that can come in and the national Sci uh, ms society funding that could come in to study those banks of samples it's really important to have a longitudinal aspect to follow somebody over the course of a disease progression because they don't really have a whole lot of markers to go after with ms research and have you been genome sequenced is that did that come up I have not. Uh, yeah, I would definitely say the kind of the awareness aspect, really making sure that the entire community knows which areas will really you can find the best help. I think I was really fortunate that I had, again, I had Matt's wife that really was able to point me in the right direction. But if I weren't, if I hadn't had that, I don't know really where I would have gone to find the help that I needed. Um, so I'll, I'll comment on the longitudinal stuff. You know, finding something that's subtle before it shows up is tricky. Uh, I'm participating in, I think, four clinical trials at Stanford, which is not far from where I live, on uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so it's called the Aging Brain Study. So they were looking for people that showed no symptoms. Uh, so that if, if you, if you uh, develop symptoms at some point, can you rewind and say what changed and when and why? Uh, and I'll, I'll reinforce a couple of, of things that we talked about. Stress makes you more susceptible to disease because your, your body is this very finely tuned system. It's amazing how strong it is. My brother tried to cut his leg off one time, accidentally bled out twice. Uh, and it just reminded me that the smallest thing the body can correct for, these, you, you wouldn't know it now, um, but the body corrects amazingly. And yet all these disease states, you know, it can't quite get them all tuned up again. Anyway, the longitudinal study, they checked me now. And I think I'm six, six or seven years into this thing. So they said, oh, you did that one. Why don't you do this Parkinson's one? Okay, why don't you do this other one? Looking at mental acuity and things like that for what are the first signs. So I don't think we, I mean, even though genomic screening is getting cheaper, I don't think you can screen everybody for everything. Uh, but uh, doing these tests early on, since we have the tools now, your experience was uh, 15 years ago, they weren't doing it then. Uh, but now if there's, if there's somebody's coming in with presenting with symptoms like ALS or a cancer disease, do a pretty full screen, you know, that might, could be families, all kinds of stuff. So I think we have to wrap that up. I think we've probably gone over. Uh, Joan, thank you as always. Dylan, Matt, uh, Please share your experiences with others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. You good? Okay, I'm so I'm not supposed to be talking a lot today, but there's one thing I just need to share because it's come up several times. So here in Arizona, we are one of the leaders in a program called All of Us. And All of Us is an NIH program with a challenge to sequence, genetic sequence, one million genomes. And they are looking for people who will participate in that clinical trial. And you can sign up at um, the University of Arizona and Banner, the magazines that are out front, there is a story in that magazine and you'll see it says, all of us. There's an orange sign in that, in that story. And I can say because I was one of the very first people to go into that clinical trial in the very beginning, they are sequencing the genomes. They are then taking your medical history. They are sharing it with researchers de-identified so that they can help find cures. Please think about participating and be joining me as part of all of us so that that, genetics, that that genetic testing that we were talking about, that genome sequencing, um, that, that you can be part of the cure. You can be part of the research. It's, we're leading in our community on that. Um, please grab a magazine on the way out and learn about that. We also heard about mentors. So I did my slides out of order, so I am going to get us back on track here. 
Um, and we talked about mentors, and I am very pleased to bring up to the stage now Dr. Francine Hardaway, who is one of my mentors, and, um, and her panel. So come on up. Francine, Chris, Lena, come on back, and Taylor. I'll sit on the end. I haven't been out of the house in three years because of COVID, so I'm a little rusty on this public stuff. But this is, I did this for Joan because this is the most important panel of the whole thing, is the voice of the patient. This morning is the important morning. And I was listening to these stories that were coming out this morning and I was feeling, first of all, enormous gratitude because I'm 81 and I don't have cancer yet. I mean, I, I fully expect that I will have it, but I don't have it yet. So that's, that was my first feeling was enormous gratitude. And then my love and empathy and sympathy from for all of you for when you got your diagnoses and how you must have felt and you you've all given such positive stories about the treatment that you've gotten um, but there are a lot of negative stories also and okay I'll share my story first. Joan gave me this sheet of paper and I have to follow it. I'm not a person who follows <laughs> instructions, but uh, I'll tell you my story. Uh, my story is that I decided a long time ago that I was trying, that I was going to get on board the anti-aging movement. And so about 12 or 13 years ago, I became vegan. And I still am vegan, although I've started to add some sardines because you're supposed to need more protein and more omega-3s as you get older. And once I became vegan, I got into the nutrition conversation and the nutrition wars about whether it should be vegan or it should be keto or it should be whatever. But, you know, my feeling is it... And the big thing that you take away from all of that is it shouldn't be the regular American diet and it shouldn't be processed food. And the other thing that I took away from it was um, some really um, interesting views on exercise. I had always been a runner and I thought I was just running because of heart disease. I mean, to prevent heart disease. But I realize now that running was the luckiest thing I ever did in my whole life because now it turns out that exercise is the other big kahuna of keeping you alive longer. And then the other thing that I was blessed with was I love to sleep and I loved my bed. So I've always gotten eight hours of sleep. Joan knows this. In fact, everybody knows it. I leave everything to, so that I can get to bed by 9 o'clock. And they were all like, you're crazy. But, you know, I'm not crazy. I'm here. Anyway, <laughs> my, I, so, far, so far this has worked well for me. And the reason that I am so concerned about it is that I think we have a place where you have to start navigating the, from the patient perspective, and you have to do that at a very young age, and that is access to primary care, good primary care that does all the screening and does all the prevention so that you don't wait until you're, you know, how old, maybe some people, even Medicare age, before you find a primary care physician and you get a bunch of tests and you find out things. Anyway, that's me. In my other incarnation, I coach startups, but um, that's enough. Um, you are next, although we've heard Yeah, you've heard my story, it. so I'm going to go ahead and skip. I'm Lena Spottleson again, and then I'm going to pass it on. Okay. Okay, I was scared it was going to play. Okay. Um, 
My name is Taylor Hoffman, and I am 26 years old. I've had type 1 diabetes since I was one and a half. And when I was five, I was misdiagnosed with cystic fibrosis, which ended up being celiac disease. So just by changing my diet, I, you know, that was a conversation, even talking about doctors listening to you. They didn't listen to my parents and different symptoms I was having, and they gave them a diagnosis that was uh, life-altering that then ended up being something as simple as just taking gluten, gluten out of your diet. And then when I was 13 years old, I wasn't feeling good, and my hair was falling out, and I just felt really tired, and I got diagnosed with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. And again, simple, um, just a love with thyroxin every morning for the rest of my life. And then when I was just actually during COVID, so October of 2020, I had been waken, awakening, excuse me, wake, awakening. Getting up. <laughs> with getting up, getting up <laughs> in, the, in the morning with severe um, pain in my joints. And I had complained about it to my doctors and they thought that it was just stress and making it up similar. You know, you're 25 years old and you're going and through you're a lot. And you're a woman. And you're a woman, yeah. You can't get me started on how women are mistreated in the healthcare system, but there I've said it. Hey, I got stories all day Damn for right. you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I couldn't figure out what was going on and I said, I swear I have arthritis. And I had brought that up to my endocrinologist and again, they thought I was crazy and just making it up. And I called a primary care and got a referral to a rheumatologist and come to find out it is rheumatoid arthritis, which also was a sexist conversation when it came to <laughs> treatment. Um, I wanted something as aggressive as possible because I'm 26 and if I have it now, I'm going to have it for the rest of my life. So that conversation, sex, sexism in and of itself, was, well, we don't want to put you on this medication in case you want to have children. And so it wasn't even a consideration whether or not that was something that I had wanted for myself. And so that's been a conversation even with endocrinology, how much of it is hormonal. And having male doctors... Oh, hormonal. That's, that's the key word for women. Exactly. Hormonal. And so that's even been a battle that I've had personally with trying to explain myself and distancing myself from what it means to be a woman because conversations that I've had with male doctors would not go the same way if it was a male patient. And um, all of these experiences and also navigating the healthcare system when it comes to access to insulin has been its own tornado and whirlwind, whirlwind of chaos. And um, it actually inspired me to seek my uh, pursue a career in medicine. And so now I am a first year medical student at the University of Arizona, right down the street. And so conversations like today are really important for me. We have a program there where we're teaching people, we're playing acting class, teaching people how to be doctors. And different stories that I've heard so far are things that I've had to explain to my fellow students that our own staff aren't explaining to our students about how you have to talk to patients and giving them options. What do they want for their care? Give them all of the information that you can. And so I just am really grateful to be here. And that is the best thing anyone could do for themselves is study medicine so that you know as much about, about it. You know, it's called a practice for a reason. Doctors are still finding out things. And the more they, the more they practice, the more they find out. So, Chris, tell us about you, although I know your story. Tell the audience. <laughs> My name is Chris Walker. Uh, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis 13 years ago, summer of 2009. Um, my life was pretty simple. I was the all-American boy, played hockey, football, baseball, soccer, was traveling the country pursuing my dream to, you know, be a professional hockey player and worked my way up into the minor league systems. Um, and one day after a game, that all ended. I got on the bus to go to the next game and collapsed. Uh, I woke up about 8 to 12 hours later in a hospital in the middle of Philadelphia. My team had moved on, um, called, called my parents. Uh, you guys know her as Joan. I know her as mom. 
Um, call that, my parents. That is the best mom if you're going to be in this type of situation. <laughs> this is not a mom without resources. And, and there's lots of uh, clinicians and, and doctors in here today, and I can tell you uh, the first time I've ever seen a doctor confused is when they got on the phone with my mother. Um, with the questions that she was asking and figuring out what was going on, uh, they, they were not going to let me leave there without a diagnosis. And so I did not leave that hospital, hospital until I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, I left with a diagnosis that I had no clue what that was. Um, I've now, since I've been diagnosed, I've spent the last 10 years speaking on patient advocacy, right? Uh, patients are not patterns. Clinicians are trained in pattern, and um, that's, that's not what we are. We're, we're people. Uh, because I have Crohn's and colitis and the different medications, I think I tried 12 different medications before they found one that stuck. And I'm not, I'm not a medication. I'm not a pattern. I'm a person. I needed to know, well, how do I handle stomach pain? How do I handle all of the realities of my, my life today, which is a life of Crohn's and colitis? It's not who I am. Who I am as a father, a husband, um, a businessman. I, I, I'm a lot of different things. I'm not Crohn's. I'm not colitis. I am a patient, right? This is just a disease, and I'm not a pattern. So that's, that is so important because there's, there's two things that physicians, and I love physicians. Physicians love, and by the way, I do love physicians. I have been married to two of them. So, <laughs> not, so this love is real. It's not just stage love. Um, and my last husband uh, was a radiologist, and that's what he was trained in, pattern recognition. And his greatest um, triumph was that he could recognize carcinoma in situ in, in a woman uh, from a mammogram. And that was considered a great strength at that time. Now we have found out so much about breast cancer that some carcinoma in situ we don't even treat because things move on and they move on so quickly. So let's see, her next question is, what can our community do better? Blorp, here comes my. Um, you know, I'm not sure what part of the community, I should say, can do better. Because it really isn't the physician 90% of the time. 90% of the time, the physician is doing his or her best with the allotted 10 or 12 minutes. Um, it's the system. It's the entire system. And what I think we could do better, I think, is educate patients so that they know more about their own bodies earlier. And I'm not sure where we do that because, you know, it's, maybe it's in school, maybe it's not in school, but it's somewhere where we have to train people to be more in touch with their own bodies and recognize their own symptoms as symptoms. Could you have gotten to the doctor earlier if you had known more about your body? Because you were very young. Yeah, I was, I mean, I started that process from the, the time that I started the process to the time I was diagnosed, it was nine months. And I probably, in, in that time, I probably saw about seven different doctors and had a, a bunch of different tests. In fact, uh, the, the gentleman that finally diagnosed me, Dr. Magrino over at Mayo, Mayo Clinic, um, he, he just saw MRI that I had months before. So another doctor had looked at it, didn't re recognize it was cancer because what they told me was that's not what they were looking for. Cancer doesn't run in my family. Pattern recognition. Yep. I didn't see mm -hmm. the pattern. 26 years old, uh, cancer doesn't run in my family, no other issues at hand. And that's when I said um, that that doctor, because I was a woman, he said, specifically to my husband, women of her age are self-conscious about their bodies and um, tried to prescribe me antidepressants. So I think, you know, listening to, to your patients when you go in, I think that's probably number one for me, obviously, because of my experience. 
Um, obviously, it wasn't uh, antidepressant. I've, I've actually never been depressed a day in my life. Um, and having another issue because of the cancer, probably a couple of years ago, I went in to figure out what was going on. I was I was getting hormone replacement. They were giving me two estrogen. A doctor actually tried to give me antidepressants again. So just listen to your patient. And, and You know what? I have been on antidepressants for 25 years, and I still don't know if I'm depressed. <laughs> I, some, some, dude, some dude put me on them 25 years ago, and it's very hard to get off them. So every so often I try, and I give it a go for a while, and everything gets worse. And so I figure, uh, well, I clean up my language. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, heck, the heck with it. I'll just stay on these. I'm sure they're not working, but they're not killing me either. So, <laughs> but watch out, women. Antidepressants, you know, are the, the drug of choice for, well, the drug of choice for doctors who have women patients, and the drug of choice for doctors who have men as patients is like, Adderall or Ritalin or something to make them calm down in the classroom that isn't um, uh, education that's suitable for them. Oh, I have opinions. Um, from my perspective, and I have to give a shout out to my mama in the back row. I won't point to her because she'll, cow she'll cower like, and get mad at me later. Um, anyway, but I think finding your your crew and people who are going to support you and advocate for you. I know we've mentioned advocacy so many times so far and the the importance of that. We can all say how important it is, but unless you're in that position, you don't realize how much that actually means to you and how much that affects you. And so I guess my piece of advice would be, or how the community could get involved um, more, I guess, um, would be to seek out, especially like uh, in politics now and the way that the world works and that healthcare is a business as well, that going to your state legislators and talking to them about your complaints and um, you'll be surprised how many people agree with you. You might have people who disagree as we live in, we live in a free world. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I think finding those communities and then from there you can determine where the holes are in the system and from there you can enact policy changes or new policies that don't exist already and um, I think that that's a way that you can impact not only yourself but also people down the line and then f over time you can hone those different policies and make them um, more inclusive to different people and it's not just whatever disease that you are advocating for but also people with other chronic conditions or cancer so that's my input chris chris i was holding that was really good that was good applause um oh. you don't interrupt applause especially oh, oh true in my you're, house. Right. You just you're right you're right um no i think something that's important for the community as a whole and not just patients, but clinicians and, and the, the system as a whole, is not pigeonholing someone to their disease. Um, recently, I walked into a hospital here in, in Phoenix uh, thinking I was having a Crohn's flare. They know how to handle that there. It's, it's a very pretty simple thing. They put you on some, some liquid IVs. They, they take you. They get you a, a CT. Um, it's a pretty simple process. And they were busy. There was no beds available in the ER. And so they put me in a wheelchair, and they put me in a hallway with a bunch of other patients. Well, two hours later, I, I text my wife, who's here in the room, and uh, I also know what it's like to have a very strong-willed wife. Um, she said, if you don't go up to the front and say, hey, something's really wrong, I'm going to come down there with our three kids and do it for you. And anyone who's met my kids knows that that hospital would be in flames. They're crazy. <laughs> so I, I made my way up there in a wheelchair, and apparently they had been looking for me because my appendix had burst. And I had been sitting in the waiting room in the hospital just in a massive amount just of Just getting gangrene. Yeah. <laughs> and, just, and so before you knew it, uh, I'm, I'm laying on a hospital gurney. They're rolling me back to surgery, and I'm calling my wife. Hey, I'm going into surgery. Love you. I'll text you when it's over. And, again, my wife was as strong-willed as she is. Was, what the hell is going on? Um, and so 
if I would have came in as a patient instead of a Crohn's patient, I think it would have been handled a lot differently. If I would have just been a healthy, normal guy without a chronic illness, I would have been treated a lot differently. Than yeah, they someone. would have tested you for appendicitis. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Instead of just, oh, this is just some kid saying he's got a stomach ache when he's got a chronic illness. Um, so I think looking at patients as a patient and not a disease or a pattern is very, very important. And I'm, I'm kind of beating the same drum here, but I see it as a huge problem. Um, and I've, I've witnessed it and, and felt it firsthand. Well, what I think as a, as a sort of a, a wrap-up for this, what we need really from the system is collaboration. We need doctors to collaborate with one another. We need, um, and I don't know how to make this happen because I, I understand what kind of job being an ER physician is, but we need more uh, collaboration in the emergency room because it's increasingly the emergency room is, is a lot of people's primary care. So I'd like to give a shout out to Medicare because I have never had better health care than since I got on Medicare. I didn't choose a Medicare Advantage plan, so I don't have vision and dental and all that. But I have first-rate care with no gatekeepers and no co-pays. And if you can afford that, this is the first time things have really gotten treated for me in a timely fashion. And then I'd also like to shout out the new generations of primary care practices because primary care practices are changing very rapidly and there are some really, really good ones. I happen to belong to and love one medical group, but there's also one called Forward and there's one called Oak Street. There are a number of primary care um, practices that have decided that if they go nationwide, they can get better data and they can get you know, more collaboration from people in other states and cities who see different things, and they can actually give better care because it's really all about the data. You know, yes, you're an individual, but you also are a data point, <laughs> you know, and so we've got to figure out a way to steer between the individual who needs the hands-on help and the, the data point that gives you the knowledge to eliminate at least some things from the many things that can kill us. And then the third shout out goes to the human body because the human body, given half a chance, will repair itself or at least try to repair itself. So. For those of you who don't practice any kind of prevention, I would just suggest from 81 years of experience, start. Because if you can stay out of this healthcare system at, the, at this tumultuous time until it evolves into whatever it's going to evolve into, I would do that. Last words, ladies and Chris. The All of Us program, shout out to them too. Oh, I'm going to do that. I did 23 and Me, but I'll do all of us. All right. You can have it, Joan. Although we do have doctors here in the room, you know. All right. Oh, wait, somebody has a question. Yes, Kai. Uh, yes, uh, Kai, come up here. They can't hear you on the video. It's all about the video, dude. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Kai. Uh, I'm a physician, but uh, didn't practice for a long time. I just want to have three comments on this. Um, amazing, Francis, you are sharing uh, anti aging, but you forget one one thing, the sense of humor. I think this is <laughs> something can keep you going for, for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> the, 
the second thing is when we talk about you know what we can do uh, yeah to make patient be more aware is important but uh, when i was at medical school we never study patient we study disease uh, and so I would like that if we can push the medical uh, program to extend a study uh, of disease, not just about the symptom treatment and so on, we should add it, uh, a part of how the patient see this disease, how they, how they feel it, wh where, where we went through. So then they have a dimension of the patient embedded in each of the disease that, that you study. Uh, the last thing is you were talking about you are not a pattern and um, uh, today as you know AI um, you know a lot of AI in drug discovery and so on and all this AI is based on machine learning which is big data and we talk about data if you work only on data you only have pattern so it's quite my second life, if I may say. I have PhD in AI and I work in AI for 30 years and it's why we, we, we are working not on pattern but on causation. So this is the next generation where we have to focus. So each person has different cause of where it is. So if you only use pattern, you're going to have just uh, an effort. Sorry? I'm physician, but <laughs> I have been married. <laughs> Would you say systems theory? Theory? Systems theory. Systems. Th oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you have different system theory, uh, and uh, the thing is, a lot of people either misconcept or mislead. You cannot discover causality just with data. So I say it loud, life science is not data driven, it's knowledge driven. Because knowledge is the most powerful way to compress data. It's what human we do. And from there we can do reasoning on the causality and not just on the pattern. Thanks, Kai. Barbara and Jack? And by the way, yeah, I would like to take it one step for, forward. Yes, life science is about the data. But what we do is about the people. And if we keep focusing on the people and use every tool that we have, from the science to the data, to the patterns, to the systems, so that we make life better for people, then we're doing it the right way. All right. You guys ready? We're not only ready, but I'm going to pass this microphone on to my husband. We're a team. And as you can see up there, and the mysterious sunglasses, it does make them only mysterious and sexy. But aside from that, I just want to say to everybody sitting here, this is wonderful. Joan, you're going to have to make this part of the regular session because we have a lot of people to educate, and I think it has to be collaborating and doing it together. So God bless all of you for sharing this, and you're all heroes. I'm going to turn it over to my hero husband, Jack Cavanaugh. That's my uh, Joe Biden impression, by the way, in my photograph. Um, I'm the patient here, and uh, I have multiple my myeloma. 31 years ago, Barbara and I were about to get married in Boston, and I went for it when I was being transferred overseas. All my working career was largely spent overseas in many different countries. And I was getting ready to go overseas again, and the uh, physical was required by the, my employer to do that. I went to a GP, and he said, uh, with the results, uh, he said, eh, there's some protein there, I want to have a doctor look at and he said uh, um, he gave me the name of a doctor and he said he's an oncologist which was really frightening and uh, anyway ultimately I went to the oncologist and he uh, sent me to a specialist at uh, Dana-Farber in Boston and I was identified as having multiple myeloma. Uh, the specialist happened to be one of the best uh, most re revered myeloma specialist in, in the world, actually, uh, Ken Anderson at, at Dana-Farber. 
Anyway, uh, I told Barbara, I said, well, I guess we can't get married then because, uh, you know, you don't want to marry me with, with this. And I said, you're not getting away with that. <laughs> so anyway, here we are. Um, so for the next 12 years, we traveled overseas um, on many different countries or several different countries and back to the U.S. and then back. Uh, we were in Holland and came back to Wisconsin and to Turkey, to Ireland, to England. Uh, and eventually uh, back in Phoenix when I retired. The, uh, so there were some unique uh, issues in dealing with uh, trans traveling like that. Um, one was the network of doctors, which was very important because uh, Dr. Anderson, for instance, uh, referred me to a specialist in Holland. Um, and I was smoldering uh, with myeloma at the time, which means that they don't treat you. Uh, when I was in Holland, uh, we were out one night and I sneezed and I broke a rib. And so the uh, specialist that they had recommended, uh, Dr. S uh, Anderson had recommended, uh, said, okay, I think it's about time to start some treatment because myeloma weakens the bones. Um, so anyway, uh, I had chemo and it worked. And then I went on a maintenance of uh, interferon for the Every day I would uh, shoot myself with um, interferon, and that went on for many, <laughs> many years. And I had a relapse when we were living in London. Again, a little net through a network of doctors, I was able to re get referred to a uh, myeloma specialist. And uh, then we moved back here, and I'm now in the Mayo system. Um, and and so a number of things happen as your uh, as your as my career was going on and I was dealing with this disease. One of the things that uh, I did not want to have happen, and this is probably common today, but maybe not as common as it was when I was uh, in my working career, and that is the confidentiality. I did not want my employer to know that I had cancer, uh, which put kind of restrictions on uh, Barbara because wives talk about what their husbands are doing and whether they're ill or not ill, etc. Fortunately, I was able to work. Uh, no, no, really, no time off. But that was an important aspect um, of the way we lived our lives. Um, not in secrecy, but just being careful. Um, some of the things that, uh, as a patient, and Barbara's a caregiver, uh, which you'll talk about in a moment, um, that I think are important in the medical system, um, I really had not experienced um, Mayo, the Mayo system until I had uh, been uh, diagnosed uh, with, uh, with my, myeloma. And uh, I first started using them when we were living in Wisconsin and went over to uh, Rochester. That system, I, th I think, is the gold standard. And I have been associated with other systems before that. And my sister lived in Florida and it was uh, recently died. And it was extraordinarily difficult for me in her final years to take care of her because she was going to different uh, doctors and getting records transferred and so on. Uh, so uh, it's a system. Uh, many organizations now have portals. Uh, they have a portal. It's so easy uh, to put your request in. You get contact with your doctor or PA. And um, it's, uh, I, I think, for young uh, people going into different systems, they should, they should look at that as a standard. Um, I think it's important for young students now, especially, to maintain contacts after they get out of school because uh, through conventions or just uh, emails uh, through, to your fellow students, because you never know when you're going to have a patient come in and uh, they're going to be moving to an area or they, they, you identify them with a particular disease uh, that needs uh, a specialist uh, in that area. and. Those contacts within your profession, I think, are important. Uh, a caretaker is extraordinarily important. Um, caregiver, sorry. Uh, if you can at all in your family pick someone that you know is capable of doing it and saying, look, I want you to be my caretaker, uh, it, assuming that uh, that person is reliable and would agree to do that. because. It's, it's uh, very difficult, especially with a, a serious disease like cancer, where when you go to uh, even a routine you know, meeting with your doctor, it's going to be, uh, uh, new. it may well be news that you have emotionally, it's very difficult to absorb at that time. 
Uh, I, uh, Francine spoke about, uh, Francine is, she's here or not here, but anyway, Francine spoke about exercise. That's something I do as a patient, uh, and I really, really get a lot out of it uh, mentally, uh, for sure. And I think uh, uh, doctors uh, should always uh, try to find out what the lifestyle of their patient is and encourage them to do exercise. And Francine mentioned sleep, which is becoming more and more important. Uh, we're right, uh, research is recognizing how important that is in, uh, in your lifestyle. Um, doctors should be open. They should not get upset when uh, someone says, I wanted to get a second opinion. Uh, we, I can't tell you, Barbara can can't tell you how many people through our contacts in the multiple myeloma community that have called her and said, okay, what do I do now? And for, the first thing is, have you had a second opinion? Um, or a or, third opinion or, have, or a fourth opinion. Or have you gone to a, a particular specialist in your field? Uh, so doctors, uh, even though they, it's difficult sometimes now with the system uh, to, for doctors to say, well, if I do that, they're going to leave my, my practice and I'm going to have to find, you know, the, the, there's a uh, cost factor there. But it's very, very important for the patient to get that second opinion and particularly with a specialist if you have anything that's uh, really, really serious. Um, I think I'll... Uh, I'll turn it over to Barbara now, who can talk about what um, what we've done or what she has done. She's been the driver of this uh, to uh, help the patient in the field of multiple myeloma. And now in all cancers, we have a program, a virtual program, that will be coming out early next year for all cancer caregivers. I'm really proud to be here. I'm proud because he's sitting here, and every day, as you know, is a challenge. And the reason I feel so emotional about it is when I hear each of your stories, it's one that I've lived. And because of that, when uh, we were overseas, as he said, I had to keep it a secret. And that was very difficult. But I did something because I'm a social worker and I'm always trying to fix things and people and systems. But what I did was I always volunteered. And by the way, the American Women's Club is the best volunteer group in the world. And what we did, we always worked, it was my suggestion, I let it, um, was that we would work with children with cancer. And I learned an awful lot. It didn't matter the age, the size, the religion, the, the um, language, that when you're working with the family, and you're helping children, then you can really make a difference. But I found when we came back from overseas, we were very lucky because I met Dr. Rafael Fonseca and Dr. Jeff Trent, and they asked me if I would do a seminar to educate other patients with myeloma because I had a background in education and social work, and I'm an advocate, and I'm a PIA. You know what that stands for. And so I said, yes, I'd be happy to do it, but I don't know anything about myeloma. To your own experience, most of the time, when you get some of these diseases, as you were saying, we are not a disease. We're individuals. But the fact of the matter, if we don't even understand what what our you know what what we have or what we're dealing with, um, then it's even harder to try and cope with it or live with it, and and that's really became my theme. We called it living with myeloma, and we started doing conferences and started out with thirty people in two thousand and four. I had to become a nonprofit, and let me warn anybody: don't become a nonprofit. But anyway, what I'm saying is it's complicated. But more important is that what we found in bringing people together and bringing the doctors to the people, and then they would be talking directly to people, um, that it was mutually beneficial. And it was wonderful, and it began to grow. But we also found that um, we would have different uh, specialists. We ha also had nurses and social workers speaking and other people who were, you know, in the general cancer field, which, by the way, cancer is a major industry, and that in itself is a whole another system we navigate. But what's important is 
our vision and our mission from day one was awareness, education, and advocacy. And then I added another you know, mission statement, which is collaboration. We have to work together. We have to talk to one another. And I know it used to aggravate, and it still does. Um, Jack has lost all privacy because I tell everybody. Um, you know, and, he, and what I found was when he would stand up at our conference and say, I'm Jack Kavanaugh, I'm the patient, she's my boss. And then what he would say is, you know, it started out when we first came back. I've been, you know, I'm a survivor of cancer, you know, 13 years. Well, now he stand, when he stands up and says, I'm a survivor for 31 years. And you know what? We all have to take a role in it. It's not only the patient. It's the caregiver or caregivers, the family. It's also the physicians and also I learned through Jeff Trent about clinical trials. And so we started educating patients about clinical trials. Because who knew you could ask it to be in a clinical trial? You know, who knew there were so many clinical trials? So all of that is about educating ourselves to be there. And it's so good, and I know for all of you, when you're fortunate enough to have a family member or dear friend go with you to every appointment. I, I think I missed one appointment of probably, I'm happy to say, a thousand because he has gone and we do a lot of what we call uh, preventive by going more often. They say, well, you know, Jack, you're really not on any medication. You're very stable. Well, we go every three months. We go for a full review, you know, top to bottom. And other things have developed over the years, and we've been able to address them because we knew to ask. And don't let anyone tell you what you should do without also letting you know what the options are, but also what the side effects are. And again, being able to make that choice with information and resources. One of the other areas that we became involved in was part of our mission is reaching out to the underserved. Now, we, you hear a lot about that, but the accessibility is not necessarily because of someone's religion or race. It's often distance. It's often the lack of facilities that aren't everywhere and people not knowing about them. So we were up in the Navajo Nation. We did awareness up there. They were very afraid of the word research because, as you know, there have been some very negative experiences. Well, we brought up some real live researchers who were really, as you know, many of you are, really nice people. And so, again, you know, the, the taboos, the fears, and... What I can say is for every one of you, we all, when we hear, for, for in our case, those three little words, you have cancer, he has cancer, she has cancer, your child has cancer, your partner, it changes your life forever. And what you do with it is the real choice you have. And I always say to people, we always said to each other, we can't plan to, we can plan tomorrow, but we need to live today. And so I say to all of you, God bless you, and let's all work together and make a difference. And by the way, we not only are still doing our cancer caregiver education programs, we are also starting our virtual program. And I have a card that explains we're doing a free cancer conference, cancer caregiver conference on October 26th. And you're all welcome and help yourself to the information because you, like some others, you can help save a life. So talk about it. Right, Jack? I'm so bossy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Barbara. Look at that. Jack's now becoming the caregiver. Yeah. <laughs> it's mutual. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, we are now coming into the home stretch. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage the co-chairs of Arizona's Bioscience and Healthcare Caucus at the Arizona Legislature, Representatives Daniel Hernandez and Justin Wilmoth.
Yeah. Oh, the awkward part's out of the way. Yeah, they, they dance really well together. All right, so, so first of all, again, I want to deeply share my appreciation with our patients and their families and everyone that has been with us today and everyone that's going to be watching online. Um, because the voice of the patient is very, very important. But what's more important is what happens when we listen. Um, so, you know, just to get things started, they know who I am. Um, but Daniel, who are you? Uh, well, thank you so much, Joan. Uh, my name is Daniel Lidnandes. Um I am a retiring uh, member of the legislature. Lucky. I've, spent, I've spent the last six years uh, rep representing Southern Arizona, and before that served as a school board member. So I'm actually finishing my 11th year of public service down in Southern Arizona. Um, but a few years ago, the folks at Dorn Policy Group and AZ Bio came to me and said, we have this crazy idea of having legislators interact with the life sciences, with patients. Can we work on creating a bioscience caucus? And my first co-chair was a former legislator named Jay Lawrence, and then the pandemic started. So we did exactly one meeting <laughs> in person before the pandemic started. And now we've been lucky enough to have my colleague, uh, Representative Wilmeth, who used to be a House staffer, um, join us. So I'm really excited, and I'll hand it off to Justin to introduce himself. So I guess I need to talk about myself here, huh? Okay, so Justin Wilmoth, um, finishing up one term of maybe more um, in the legislature. New district is LD2, so if you live north of Thunderbird between the 51 and 17, please vote for me. Um, <laughs> I did used to be a House staffer. I was also a staffer in Oklahoma. I've been involved in politics in some way for 18 years. So I have a decent idea on how to get stuff done. I had 18 bills signed into law my first, my first term. So happy to be a part of this and uh, drive it forward in the future, hopefully. We're not going to let you get away, Justin. I, I'm stuck, right? It's like a You're Godfather stuck. three. They pull me back in. <laughs> so w for those of us that don't hang around the legislature, what exactly is a caucus? Yeah, so there are a couple of different ways that the word is used. So there's the Republican caucus, there's the Democratic caucus, which is the official caucus of both parties. But then we also have formed special groups that meet together, usually based around either an idea or a concept or an identity. Um, so there's the Latino caucus, which meets for Latino members or members who represent districts that have over a 60% Latino population. And then with us, we opened it up to everybody so that any legislator who wanted to learn more about the Arizona biosciences industry and also um, hear directly from patients, we were able to come in and bring in speakers. So when we're using the word caucus, we don't mean Democrat or Republican. We mean everybody who wants to learn more about the way that this is impacting the state of Arizona. Yeah, in this context, the caucus could mean anything. There's a rural caucus, there's a veterans caucus, there's a people in the East Valley caucus, probably. I don't, I don't know what they do out there. So that's all it means in this context. So um, when we came together, and, and it's my privilege to be the admin support for the caucus. So this is their caucus. They run it. They decide what they want to learn about. And then I have to coordinate it and get the food. That's the key part. If you want any legislative attention during session, they need to feed us, which it's, it's a bit of a joke, but our schedules are so wild, putting in 50, 60 hours a week at the legislature, we literally don't have time to get away for lunch, so we're very appreciative of that. It's kind of like doing stuff on a college campus where if you give out free food, people are more likely to show up, so it sounds silly, but a lot of these caucuses actually have like brown bag lunches where you'll have a presenter come in and speak and as much as I want to say we had people show up and listen to everything the reality is you'd have members who'd come in 10 minutes listen get the paperwork and then leave with their little sack lunch so that was one of the reasons why we had to make sure we had dynamic speakers um, because the more engaging the speakers are the more likely members are to say okay i'm only going to go for 10 minutes but they show up they start listening and they're like actually i'm going to just stay here a little longer okay. and in a an era where we hear so much about polarization um 
you know, I think one of the most powerful things that I saw this year was um, the very first caucus meeting of the year, we had Dr. Lee come in from SonoraQuest and teach the legislators what biomarkers are. And it was standing room only, and they were really interested. And, um, and then Representative Cobb um, dropped House Bill 2144, which is the biomarker bill we talked about earlier, where in Arizona, if you are covered by Medicaid, private insurance, your own private insurance, small group plans, or the state health care plans and, pl and county plans. Um, now, if your doctor says you need a biomarker test and the science and the regulatory science supports that, your insurance has to pay for it. And that was a pretty complicated bill that certain parts of the healthcare ecosystem was not real keen on. And, um, but you then invited Karen Knutson, head of the American Cancer Society, to talk to the, the caucus. And what was that like? Well, I mean, it was phenomenal, and it was a backstop to what we had had before that. It, every legislator comes from different fields, and we have to deal with three million topics every, every spring. And we're supposed to know what we're doing. And that's very challenging because we're all politicians first. So um, there's a lot of topics we don't know a lot about. We have our two or three areas that maybe we grew up with or we have a knowledge base in or that's our career. And then the rest, we're kind of flying blind with the exception of meetings like ours and lunches like ours. And so that was a great secondary kind of a booster rocket to the first one that you were talking about because it provided more information and it shared with the members how important this field is and how amazing it could be that if we're in a position to find out what people might be getting, how we can have preventative maintenance for that and avoid it altogether, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. And I would just say, I think it was a really interesting thing because for biomarkers, we had a lot of interest because people didn't really understand what that meant. Whereas with cancer, it was a little bit different because everyone knows somebody that's had cancer. So it was a little bit easier to kind of personalize it and to kind of imagine like, how did this impact me? How did this impact my family, my community? And I think when we're looking at legislation, I've been doing advocacy for 14 years. This is my 14th legislative session. What I always tell people is numbers and data are great things, but they are just tools. The things that are important are stories. So that's where having the ability to have the data is always great. So she came in and provided a lot of data. But then the conversations that came up afterwards about people saying, well, my father had X kind of cancer. My aunt had this kind of cancer allowed us to keep having conversations. So it was a good catalyst for the conversation to start and then keep going because they didn't just learn about a new topic or new data. They were able to say, okay, how did this personally impact me? And when you can get legislators, unfortunately, to think about how did this impact me and my family or my family or uh, community, it's a little bit easier to get them to understand why it's an urgent need. So that's why I always appreciate AZ Bio's work to bring in stories and to bring in folks who are patients who are actually dealing with some of the topics that we're talking about. Because then it's not just like an abstract idea that's on paper somewhere. It's not just a bill. It's I had to look you in the eye and tell you why I'm voting no or why I'm voting yes on a specific piece of legislation. Well, that's, and that's a great point because in every topic you can imagine that you've ever heard on the news or you know different groups are going to give us these things called one-pagers, which is a bunch of <clears throat> dry statistical information that's important. It's important. I like your one-pagers. But um, how do we differentiate that? And that is those stories. That is those meetings. And that's once you can personalize it, everybody needs to know how it affects them. You know, and that's the big challenge that we have. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting when, you know, I'm in the legislature, I see so many of our patient groups being actively engaged and coming and speaking with the elected leaders and sharing their stories and, and it does make a huge difference in not just getting their attention, but touching them. It was interesting. Um, Senator Gowan was at the AZ Bio Awards on Wednesday evening. And he talked about how he was brought into understanding the importance 
uh, the life sciences and the healthcare and the biosciences in Arizona, when he was at TGen and he heard one of the patients at TGen tell a, ta a, a patient story. And um, thanks to the work of, of Senator Gowan and our caucus members and everyone else at the legislature, um, this year Arizona put into law the Arizona Health Innovation Trust Fund, which they've now seeded and will continue to fund and grow, um, that will then support developing life science innovation, patient innovation in Arizona forever. And, and I want to thank you guys because including the $100,000 appropriation that went into that to seed it, it actually went to, into effect on my birthday. So that was, <laughs> that was an awesome birthday, Happy birthday present. Thank you. <laughs> We got you uh, funding. <laughs> yes. Um, now, now, can can we put three more zeros after that next year? Please, uh, please, Daniel? please. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. not going to be there. That's <laughs> not going to be my job. I'm still in the majority, so I guess I have to deal with that. <laughs> yep. And I, I would say one other thing that's really important about you all sharing your stories is don't just wait until the legislative session has started. Um, the legislative session moves very, very quickly. We start in January, and the last two years are the exception to the rule, but generally about 100 days is what happens. So from start to end, 100 days or less. So don't wait until January 30th to reach out to us for the first time. Reach out to us now. I, I think one of the things that people don't understand and realize is that we live in your communities. I'm in Phoenix a couple times a week during the legislative session, but the rest of the time I'm down in Tucson. So if you ask me to meet you um, for a cup of coffee or ask us to meet in our offices, we will meet with you. And I actually would rather meet with you and talk to you for half an hour than just get an angry email the day before a bill is up and hear for you for the first time saying, you better vote on this bill or else. Um, so building those relationships is really crucial and not waiting until just the last minute I think is really important because then when I'm looking to talk to somebody about a bill or something that's tangentially related, I can say, oh, I'm going to call Joan. And if Joan doesn't know who I can talk to, then she'll say, but let me connect you to this other person. And it's all about being able to have those resources as legislators, because like Justin said, we have very limited amount of time, but we have a ton of different topics that are being thrown at us constantly that we are not subject matter experts on. And the, the thing I would add to that is that we have these pesky things called elections every two years, and we're weeks away from the next one, pretty big one. And so I would say that to say that people that are running for office, if you reach out to them and say, hey, I want to meet and talk about issue X, they're going to do it. If, if they want to have a chance to come back, if they want to be seen as relatable, this is the year to do it. This is the time of year to do it because we're all on hair triggers trying to get mailers paid for, get out there and knock doors and things like that. And if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I want to meet with you to talk about healthcare in Arizona, well, we're going to do it. Um, so I think that's very important for you guys to take that first step because most people down there want to be involved and they want to be active and they want to meet you, period. We you come our way, we will find time. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we are all patients. At some point, we will all be caregivers. Daniel, you came to national prominence in an unexpected way in a crisis situation. Um, you're welcome to say what that was. Yeah, so I was very lucky that I attended our great public schools here in Arizona and got trained as a nursing assistant and as a phlebotomist, so I was able to provide first aid back on January 8th of 2011 when Congresswoman Gabby Giffords um, was shot, including, you know, several others that day. Um, but then, you know, even just recently, I was running around running for office, and my dad had MRSA that could not get be treated properly, so he had to have an amputated because the infection has spread. So multiple times I've had to be a caregiver. I have a pre-existing condition. I've had a thyroid condition since I was 17, and that's the thing where being able to be a legislator who understands both on the patient side but now having to help care for my father and having to work out a very difficult schedule with my sisters who are also elected officials and say, okay, dad has a, uh, a doctor's appointment on 
Tuesday at 10 o'clock and mom can't take him, which one of the other three is going to be able to help make sure that he's not going by himself to this doctor's appointment? And it's so important. And I know, Justin, you've really done some great work, you know, working in your district with, you know, members of your community and helping them and understanding, you know, a lot of the issues that they've been dealing with um, relative to affordability and, you know, accumulators and insurance and all of those important things. I, as you look towards this next session, which we fully expect you to be at, um, don't disappoint me. I'll try not to, you know, because she's the most important constituency, right? Period. <laughs> Christopher will tell you that's totally true. A thousand percent? Okay. The, there you go. See, that's On gonna, camera. See, if I don't do that in 2024, she'll come after me. So there you go. Um, you're exactly right. Like for me, like I don't have a health background necessarily other than I was a health policy advisor for a couple of years at the Arizona House and now I'm on the health committee which is great. My mom's a nurse so that's really was my my lifetime of learning uh, through through that but it ties into so many things and my old district 15 has Mayo Clinic in it so I had a lot of contacts and conversations with those folks. Uh, the new district's a little smaller because shocker people are moving here um, but I still have Deer Valley Hospital which is at 17 in the 101 so um, the biosciences, the health stuff is still very, very important. And the fact is it touches people's budgets. And if there's things that we can do on the state level to fund programs for prevention, I'm all for it because the, the problem that I have on my side, and it's not a problem, I'm a, I'm a small government conservative, but there's also things that we need to be responsible for and we need to address. And if there's an example, like we had this bill this year on a, uh, the diabetes management information for, for those on access, and some in my caucus that were on the committee are like, well, it's like a million dollars, don't vote no. And I'm like, guys, you got to look at the future. you got to look five, ten years down the road. You educate these folks, you tell them that you can solve a lot of this by eating a little less this and a little less that. It's going to save the state untold amounts of money down the, down the road. So when I look at stuff in the health committee, I look for ways to... Uh, find cost savings in the long long run, which is very nebulous. But I'm much more a fan of an upfront cost like that, knowing full well that if we can get through to the folks that we're responsible for, it can take care of itself in a lot of ways. So that's the kind of stuff I look for in the health in the health realm. Well, as an economist, I have lots of that really dry data that you love so much, I and I'll it. give it to you so you can Deal. use it. Because we need to we need to share that message with folks because the. Even the average legislator doesn't. They just look at what's in front of them. And I get that. I totally get it. Because we're dealing with, you know, a $14, 15000000000 billion budget. There's a lot of numbers flying around. But if we can make that case for this program, this bill, costs us much. Yes, it does. But over the long run, we expect this kind of a savings. It's a lot easier for, I believe, folks to support. Absolutely. And, and I'll share a quick, dirty little secret about the legislature. I think you all think that the issue that is important to you is important to us. It's not that it's not important, it's that we don't know about it a lot of the times. Because yeah. it may be the number one thing in your life, and it may not be something that I've ever even heard of. So you need to be more proactive, and that's why I think it's so great that we have this network of folks like Joan and others who are coming to us and sharing these stories, because when it's now something that I can put a face to, it is now something that's relevant and I'll dedicate time. But if it's just like this abstract idea that's going into a $15 billion budget, it's really hard to be able to have that be something that I dedicate time and energy when there are 800 bills coming across the House floor or the Senate floor. So just because it's important to you doesn't mean that it's necessarily important to us until you make it. So that's where I always advocate to be proactive build relationships, and don't wait until you need something on the day of to reach out to us for the first time. Start reaching out early because the more you can build those relationships, the more likely it is to get the attention that it needs and that it deserves. But if it's not being brought forth and it's not something that is relevant to the day-to-day -day work that I'm doing, then I'm going to be like, oh, you know, that's something I can deal with later. But it could be something that's life-changing or something that's really important to s countless People Absolutely. In Arizona. Closing thoughts, Justin. Yeah, I would I would add that being a legislator is a lot like being a college student and that if you remember the college schedule, you had this class one to get this class the other. Well, we have usually three committees apiece, usually. I know it varies less than more, but in my case, the past two years I was on health, transportation, and commerce, which means any bills that related to, obviously, health, 
road funding, economic development, that came through guys like me. And my job first and foremost was to be educated about bills that came through those three committees. Um, other folks had other committees that dealt with other topics that I didn't deal with until they came to the full house floor. So my focus was always the bills that I ran, the best bills, obviously. The second best bills were the ones in my committee. And then everything else I'd get to later, it's, uh, it's a bit like triage. So going to this understanding when you talk to your elected officials that they've probably got two or three gigantic subject areas they need to know a lot about because their 9 to 13 votes, depending on how big the uh, committee is, drives that policy to the next round. It's like the playoffs. You get out of that, you go to the cow, you go to the floor, and they have a final vote, and then it goes upstairs. So can we please have a round of applause for our panel? And more importantly, a huge round of applause for all of our patient speakers today. This marks the last public event for Arizona Bioscience Week. There were literally thousands of people that were involved in every aspect of that throughout the week. Thank you, Arizona. Thank you to all of our supporters, sponsors that made that possible. And again, um, to the Arizona State Legislature, thank you for my birthday present. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye, everybody. <laughs>